I want to use five buildings to illustrate the same five fundamental perspective points. The five things that if we keep in our mind with whatever aspect of perspective we're dealing with, we're going to end up with a far better outcome for architectural realism in our drawing. We'll start with our simple Yorkshire cottage. The first thing is to work out what's called eye level. This is also referred to as the horizon, the line where the eye level of either the person observing or more usually the camera was. And the reason why it's important is because the eye level gives us a horizontal straight line across the entire scene. Now we can see that there are lines that slope down there. We can see that here there's lines in the brickwork that slope up this way. So our horizontal line is going to be somewhere in between the two. At some point the direction will pass through horizontal as it changes direction. And I reckon just above this yellow line is the eye level. It doesn't necessarily coincide with the eye level of any people we have in our scene. In this case, I was standing on higher ground. The important thing to remember though with eye level is that while there is a line here that is horizontal, there may not be an actual line on our architecture or in our scene which lines up, it's still there. It's just that there's no physical line to observe. Now, the second point is to always identify the fan pattern that we see with our other horizontal lines, the ones that aren't eye level. So if we look at the front of the building, we can see that there are lines. We get a fan shape. And if all of these lines could be drawn off to the right, they would all meet at the one place on eye level. Eye level isn't necessarily in the middle of the lines that we see. In fact, usually with buildings, there's a lot more above eye level than below it. And we get these angles because as the building moves further away from us, it gets smaller. Well, it looks smaller. And the same thing happens off to the other side. And remember, eye level is consistent across the whole scene. These will all meet if they're lined up correctly on this yellow line as well, but on the other side. That's the third point, that where these lines meet isn't necessarily on our paper, either our photo or for our drawing. So pinpointing those places which are called vanishing points often is not a particularly useful or easy thing to do. The important thing though is to look for the fan shape pattern, work out where the fan ribs cross the horizontal and pay particular attention to the angle of the uppermost horizontal line, as well as the angle of the one furthest away, because everything between those two lines has to spread the total angles that we have between the top and the bottom. The top and the bottom of the windows have to fit within this fanning pattern. The fourth point is to pay particular attention for foreshortening. Now, we've mentioned how the wall, the height of the wall get, gets smaller as it moves further away. But also from our viewing point, the perspective, the way it looks, appears to compress, to get narrower and narrower as the wall moves away from us. And this is most obviously seen in the windows. If I were to stand and look straight on at this cottage, this space here between the corner and the first window is actually the same width as this space here. Now, it's not just that everything gets narrower, but the view changes as well. If we look at this window, that the upper and lower sash windows are divided into two. If we come though down to this furthest window, the most compressed, we see a lot less. We actually don't see any of this. We don't see this strut in this window. And we see a lot less of this pane of glass here. And the fifth, the last thing to look for, I call look beyond the box. It's easy to make the mistake of thinking that perspective happens within this space. But of course, perspective is simply how something looks from a particular viewing point, and that affects everything in our scene. And so where these lines move towards eye level, there are 
theoretical lines at least, doing the same thing in the front. We want to capture the degree to which these shrubby bushes also reduce in size height-wise and width-wise as they move further away. The relationship of size between this one and this one should be something similar to the windows. Let's look at our second photo. It's not the building that's so complicated here. It's more the viewing point. The first thing we should try and do is to find the horizontal line. So let's look at our angles. We can see in fact that they're all going in the one direction. They are all sloping downwards. Even this bottommost line is actually sloping slightly downwards, which means that eye level, if it's going to be the place where all of these lines meet up, is going to be actually underneath this line somewhere. How can the eye level be in effect below the building? And if we look over here, we can see the reason easily enough that the ground is sloping down steeply. My feet, ground level, where I'm standing is well below this level here. And so it creates a wonderful effect. The rules still work. We simply have to understand them in the geographical context that we have. If we look on this side, if we look at the angles, they get very, very steep, but there is still only one eye level. On this side, because the angles are much steeper, they join almost on the photo. We can actually plot that this is where my eye level is. It looks like I'm closer because I've actually cropped out some of the surrounds of the house, which then makes the house look closer than it was. Sometimes we find eye level by first plotting some of the more obvious perspective angles. And so all of the lines of brickwork fit the fan pattern, regardless of where they are. That's why it's so important when the angles are extreme to really plot the upper ones accurately. It's easy to start simply drawing these lines parallel instead of increasing the angle slightly with each one. We can see the foreshortening that happens. And if we want to give marks to indicate individual bricks, we need to make sure we're compressing the widths of those bricks as they move across away from us. The foreshortening on these two windows isn't as obvious as in the first house. This column blocks part of what we would see of this window, making this window actually look a little bit narrower. They look quite similar in width, but if we took this column away, this window would be observably wider than this one. And again, we look outside the box, and in this case, we've got the tops of the chimneys. So architectural details that could be some distance away from our basic core structure still have to line up and follow the angles. We know in our mind that these angles have to keep increasing slightly. Let's look at our third example. Here we have four houses put together, somehow miraculously preserved right in the heart of the Sydney CBD. So we look at the top angles and we look at the bottom angles. Well, we don't know where the ground level is actually level. And in fact, if we look at these here, they actually get smaller. So it's a fairly safe bet that the ground is sloping upwards as it moves in this direction. We can't know for sure whether the camera has been tilted or not. So we can't necessarily go by whether the line looks straight or not. But if we come up here, we can see that the line is still sloping above the eye level position. And if we come to this line, again, it's still slightly up. Probably eye level is, is going to be about here. Again, what's happening is across this very broad intersection, the ground is sloping down all the time, but eye level is actually down low. So above this line, all the horizontal lines will increase in angle whether there's an actual building line or whether it's the alignment of details such as the tops of windows or the wooden bases of the sash windows, they all have to align at an angle that increases as it moves bit by bit above eye level. We can see the foreshortening. These terraces are all identical in width, but this one 
looks a lot narrower than this one. The same with these pairs of windows, equally spaced. So we want to be capturing these details when we draw. If we have our checklist of perspective points to watch out for, it's easy to find them and therefore to observe them more carefully, more easily. And that gives us such a greater chance of drawing them more This accurately. building in Paris looks a little more complicated, but because of the decorative elements, we can see the perspective angles very clearly. The reason this angle is different to this one is because this comes forward from here. To get that straight line effect, the lines have to line up on the same plane and this wall moves forward into a plane that's closer to us than this wall. But on this wall, the same rules apply. The angle increases as it moves upwards. And for all the horizontal lines on this plane, it's the same. The angle increases as they move away above eye level. And the same thing we can see happening on the right hand side. We have a horizontal line sloping up and I can see obviously here we have a horizontal line sloping down based on this tower's wall and they're going to meet where we have a horizontal line. And if I look at this, I can see that this still slopes up slightly and this line slopes down slightly. This line slopes up slightly. This line slopes this way slightly. This line looks pretty straight. In fact, eye level is slightly below that line and that gives us a straight line right across our building, just the top of that yellow line. As I said, there isn't necessarily an actual line where this happens. And here we have a more complex building, but exactly the same principles apply. We have perspective angles because the building is getting smaller as it moves further away. So this is sort of our main perspective angle here. But let's take the base of these columns here. We can see, in fact, that these lines are going to join some way off to the left. We need to be careful with these lines because we don't know if the ground is sloping at all. If we look across, we can see the way the architecture changes with foreshortening, particularly these arches. As they move further away, this archway becomes less rounded. It becomes narrower, more elliptical. We also see that these more square shapes of glass that we can see become narrower and narrower, and it's actually a rectangle. In fact, it's not much wider than the width of the wall in this furthest window. And if we look at this, it's not just the fan pattern, it's not just trying to work out where exactly these perspective angles meet at the vanishing point, and for that to help us work out eye level. And it's not just foreshortening, but it's also looking outside the box. In this case, outside the box would include these statues on the roof. They form another horizontal line, another line in the fan pattern. If we look at what we can see in our building down here, we can see some lines. And I can see, for instance, that there are some lines in the building here that join up horizontal lines. This line then slopes slightly upwards towards the left. So eye level is going to be a little bit higher. Somewhere just at the base of these trees. Again, because I'm standing on something that lifts me up above the ground level. And there's also an increase in ground level from here across to where I am. But what we do need to see when we look beyond the box is that these trees also approximately follow the same fan shape pattern. If we line up the tops of the trees approximately with the base of the trees, we see they fit the pattern because these trees were all planted at the same time and they were planted and grown and pruned to all be approximately as close as could be achieved the same size. And so all the issues of perspective, particularly foreshortening, start to happen. One tree finishes here, one tree finishes here, one tree finishes there, one tree finishes there. There's one tree here. I think there's actually two trees.
But what we see is that obviously the trees, that each individual tree gets narrower and narrower. And when we draw this, we also want to be making whatever marks we use to create the effect of the leaves, we want them to get smaller and smaller as they move further away to give the sense that the trees are moving away and are looking smaller down here than up here. Talking of outside the box, if we look at the tops of these two lamp posts, because they're aligned in a straight line parallel to the front line of this building, they also fit the fan pattern. And if we're not looking for perspective patterns beyond the architecture or beyond the main architecture, we can easily miss that and make this lamppost way too tall or too small. And if you found this helpful, can you remember the like button? It's a really great exercise to do, particularly when we don't feel like drawing, to find some photos of architecture. What can I understand? What can I see about perspective, about what I know about perspective, demonstrated in this reference? It's fantastic practice at learning what things we need to observe in architecture and in street scenes in particular, in general, to be able to capture the perspective accurately. G'day, I'm Stephen Travis. I hope you found this helpful. Perspective is a wonderful thing once we can understand it and apply it in real life situation because it actually makes our job easier. It lets us anticipate what we're seeing faster than we could have observed it because it gives us a tip off, it gives us a head start that lets us see it more easily and draw it more precisely. But look, whatever you draw, however you draw it, make sure you have fun. I'll see you next time. Bye.